and I do want you to know that'll be available. Are you ready this morning? Yes. We're going to go for it. This Renews You series is a transformative series, which means the goal is for you to activate some things in your life that transforms who you are, what you're doing, what you're about, where you're going, who you hang with, what's priority. It's transformative, and so it's one of those places where you kind of shake the thing to see what falls out. Like, okay, what do I have on the top that should be at the bottom? What's on the bottom that should be at the top? And all of those types of things in life where we transform who we are, what we're doing, and why we're doing it. And here's the idea around it. It'll guide you to restoration, new beginnings, and honestly, a revival of what has been lost. How many know some things have been lost? Throughout tragedy, throughout times, throughout struggle, we lose that dream. We lose that hunger. We lose the passion inside of us through some things like that. And it's time for that to be revived. The Lord's going to stir some things back alive inside of you because he wants to use you in the earth. And so last week we learned this, that the most important foundation to build your life upon, to build your life upon, is knowing Christ, to know God, to make space for him, to make time for him, and to truly pursue him. That is the foundation of renewing you. If you want to know who you're called to be, it doesn't start with going out in the woods and trying to find yourself. <laughs> Please don't do that. You will find something you don't want to find. No, go after God. Go find him. Seek him. That's where we find out who we really are. And so the foundation of this is that we would know him and be one with him. So much so that the apostle Paul said this, I compare everything to knowing Christ as garbage. What a priority check. That compared to knowing him, everything else is garbage. And that was the challenge last week, that what would you consider garbage to get to know him? What would you move out of the way that's been there to say, no, he is more important than that? And that's the comparison that Paul put before us. And so today I want to give you the next level of renew you. Are you ready for it? I believe you are. If you've got a Bible, go to John 10. How many of you in here believe there's a devil? Okay, about half. Okay, the other half will work with you. Your Bible believes there's a devil. How many of you believe the devil has a plan for your life? That's a different thought. Yes, he does. Some people think, oh, he can't see me. <laughs> he'll leave me alone, right? If I don't believe he exists, he'll leave me alone. Not true. I want to show you this. John 10, 10. John 10, verse 10 says this, the thief comes, the thief is Satan, the thief comes, check this out, only to steal and kill and destroy. He has a plan for your life. There is a devil and he has a plan for your life and it's this, to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life. He wants to do anything he possibly can to get you off the planet so you will not fulfill the will of God in your life. And that's either killing you or distracting you, which I would say are pretty much the same. It's interesting, isn't it? He has a plan for your life to steal, kill, and destroy. Look what Jesus says, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. This is Jesus talking. The enemy comes only to steal, kill, and destroy your life, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Allow me to propose to you this morning that most people, I believe this progression that we read here is how it shows up in most people's life. Most people start life being stealing, stolen from, killed, and destroyed in some way, shape, and form, and they never experience the abundant life that God has for them. Most people start out life with some type of bondage, some type of rejection, some type of frustration, something they don't know how to sort out, and it becomes the leading force in their life before they ever get to experience the abundant life that God's promised. And so for most of their life, they're on this kilter of going, yeah, you promised it, but why am I struggling with this? Why is this the leading force in my life? Because for most people, the enemy sneaks in right away and does something in your life that gets you off kilter where you're experiencing the stealing, killing, and destroying before you are the abundant life of God. And so we end up with something being the leading force in our life rather than God. And it looks like bondage. It's a bondage for most people. We're bound to some kind of lie. We're bound to some type of insecurity. We're bound to some type of rejection. 
the fear of failure. We're bound to some horrible situation. And we start out bound before we ever experience the life that God has promised us. And it's not on God. It's on us to sort things out correctly and lay a hold of that for which he laid a hold of us. And so I want to show you how to renew you today. And here's the challenge that you would face your bondage in a bold way. That's my challenge for you today, that you would face your bondage in a bold way, that you would stand up against it, that you would get up in the face of it and face it in a bold way because renew you is at stake. The ability to walk out what God has prepared for you is at stake. And so what we see is the Apostle Paul begins to pray for the Ephesian church And the prayer that he actually prays over this church is actually a pathway to your walk with God. You might not know it, but God has a plan for you to walk out. Every believer is to walk it out. And Paul shows it in his prayer to the Ephesian church. I want to show you this. Look at Ephesians, if you got a Bible, chapter 1. Oh, come on, I want to hear some pages turn. Y'all need to bring your Bibles to church. Let's go. So important that you get the word of God in you. Ephesians chapter 1, this is so good. I love this because I'd love for you to circle some things and highlight some things and mark it up. Well, I can't write in my Bible. Then go put it in a glass case and buy one you can write in, one you can live out of. So important. Oh, I better not be in that mood this morning, huh? Okay, here we go. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at this. He says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the, that, the, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Here's why. So that you might know him better. Notice the purpose. There is an actual spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you can know God better. Some of you don't even know you can know him. You just think it's a denomination. A thing we just do, check boxes. It's a religious thing we do. We just go check boxes. No, you can know God. And you can't, it's not that you just know him. You know him better and better and better and better. Just like you would your spouse or a friend or somebody that you're willing to pursue. He's saying that you would know him better. This is the first step in our journey, that we would know God. And then look what he says. I also pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance, notice this, in his holy people. You weren't called to do this alone. You were called to do this with his people on a team, on a winning team. You were called to be a part of something bigger than yourself. I want to look into this a little bit because to renew you is to take this journey in your life. To renew you, to really experience what God has for you, it's upon you to take next steps. It's upon you to say, I'm going to keep moving. And I'm going to purposely move myself along this journey. Number one, it's the foundation that I would know God. And that I would know Him better. That I wouldn't just be okay with knowing about Him. I want to know Him. I'm not okay with just knowing that there is a God. I want to know Him. Here's why this is important. That the eyes of your heart might be enlightened, Paul says. And some people would say, well, some of you brilliant people out there would say, Paul, that's cute, but your eyes are not on your heart, they're on your head. Nice try. One more reason why I don't believe the Bible. To which Paul would say, no, actually your eyes are on your heart. Because you live through what you've experienced. You and I live out of what we're experiencing, and that's what Paul is saying. You live out of what you've been through, you live out of what's been done to you, and you live through and see life through what you have experienced. That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, I'm praying that your eyes would be enlightened so that you could see what you're living out of, that you could see how you see life. Notice this, you don't see that until you know God. You don't recognize what you're living out of until you know God. Knowing God illuminates the fact that I'm living out of something. I'm living out of something that was done to me. I'm living out of something I experienced. Or I'm living out of something I think to be true. 
And I'll never know what that is until I know him. Knowing him is the only thing that enlightens my eyes to see what I'm living out of. And notice this, it's not until that step that I, re I understand why I'm on the planet. If your eyes are enlightened and you can see what you're living out of, you can deal with it and then turn and find hope in your calling. Hope is connected to what you're called to do, not stuff. Hope is connected to your calling, not a bunch of things. Not a lot of routines, not, not a better job, not a better spouse, not better kids. No, hope is connected to your calling. But you'll never see your calling until your eyes get enlightened to, what have I been living out of? I'm living out of something. And I won't know it until I'm willing to know God. People who don't know God don't know what they're living out of and why. And more than likely, you're living out of some type of rejection some type of pain, some type of struggle, and we need our eyes enlightened so that we can walk in the calling of God. This is your purpose. And so here's the thing. Every one of us has a story. Every one of us. Every one of us has some story that we submit to, that we live out of. And I would go as far as to say if your eyes haven't been enlightened, that story is hindering you, not helping you. Yeah, but, yeah, but. In light of the will of God for your life, it's hindering you. Yeah, but in light of your calling, in light of hope, it's hindering you, not helping you. And the ability to renew you is to deal with that story. To deal with what am I living, to have your eyes enlightened to see, why am I living out of that experience? Why am I living out of what they said to me in fifth grade? Why am I living out of what that boy told me in sixth grade? Why am I living out of that thing that happened to me in high school? Why am I still living out of that thing that took place in college? Why am I still living out of that situation that happened all those years ago? Why am I still moved by that? You'll never be able to face that until you know God. Until you begin to pursue God him he's the only one that can erect it and allow you to go oh that's weird i haven't realized how much pull that had on my life the way i acted the things i did and the people i surrounded myself with you mean i'm not rejected you mean i'm not a failure you mean it wasn't my fault only knowing him allows you to have your eyes enlightened so that you can turn and find the hope of your calling. You'll never know why you're on the planet if you're living out of something that's not real. Something that can be dealt with by having your eyes enlightened through knowing him. I want to show you a story of a woman that did this today in the scriptures. It's found in Luke chapter 7. And as we look at her situation it's a woman who probably had an unfair, very abusive upbringing, probably treated barely, really, really unfairly. And in her day, if you didn't have a man in your life, there was a chance you weren't going to make it because they were the provider, they were the authority. And more than likely, she was either divorced, enslaved, or beaten in some way, shape, and form that she was just left to fend for herself. And her upbringing was very unfair, mistreated. She had a story. She had a story that wasn't fair, and when it's not fair, you usually feel like, well, I get to hang on to this then. But she does something significant, and I want you to see this today because I believe we all can learn something from this. So powerful. Verse 36 through 38, it says this, that one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. And so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from the city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. The fact that the scriptures call in her an immoral woman means she was more than likely a prostitute and more than likely made her living that way. She more than likely lived on the streets to provide for herself. And she hears that Jesus is coming to town. Now, at this point, Jesus was moving through the earth, doing phenomenal things, healing people, delivering people, revealing the love of the Father to people where they're like, 
oh my goodness, and he's becoming known. And so she hears he's coming to town. Man, so many people hear of Jesus, don't they? They hear of God, but she shows up to see him. I want to know him. I want to know who this is. And so she shows up to meet this Jesus. And the thing about it is she shows up with this beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume, which I think is very significant. This woman was more than likely mistreated her whole life. She probably walked around completely rejected, trying to hide her face, trying to, you know, duck behind when people of success would walk by the streets. It was like, I don't even count. I don't even fit. I feel so stupid, and probably all of her life trying to look for some kind of meaning, trying to find something that would give her some type of identity, that I matter. Does anybody see me? Does anybody even care? Does God even care? I mean, she's searching for something that would give her identity, something that would say, I have a place in the earth, and aren't we all looking for that somewhere? Do I fit? Do I fit? And she's searching for something. And I imagine walking through the the city street, she sees in this little marketplace the alabaster jar of perfume worth a year's wages, crazy expensive, and probably thinks to herself, if I could ever just purchase something like that, I would be somebody. If I could ever get my hands on something that those people have, that those people have in their homes, that those people get to experience. If I I could ever just get my hands on something like that, man, I'd be worth something. I'd I'd have a marking. I'd have an identity. I'd have something to live for and say, hey, look, I matter. I made it. I arrived. I fit in. And I imagine she worked and worked and worked and did all she could and finally got her hands on this crazy expensive perfume, this alabaster jar of perfume. And for her, it was identity. For her, it was something. For her, it mattered. For her, it gave her purpose. For her, although her story was horrific, it was the one thing in her story I accomplished. I did it. I matter. I'm supposed to be on the planet. I fit. And to her, it was this precious thing. And it's interesting to me that she shows up to meet Jesus with it. That you're going to go meet Jesus and that's what you're going to take. Because it probably was the one thing that would make her fit. It was probably the one thing that she could hold out front to say, I made it. I'm okay. I'm doing it. It's funny how we try to impress Jesus, isn't it? Rather than just get really, really real with him. No, she thought if she could showed up, she could show Jesus, I'm, I'm doing it without you. <laughs> I'm, I'm arriving. I've made it. Hey, I'm doing okay by myself. I'm doing okay. And it was her one thing to show, it's all right, Jesus. I know I'm going to meet this Jesus guy, and I'm going to let him know, hey, I'm making it. I, look what I got. I mean, I'm doing good. We all have these. I think it's funny. We all have these alabaster jars in our life, whether it's as simple as driving a car we can't afford to impress people we don't know at the stoplights or the beautiful clothes we look for, or all of the things, that, the new jobs, the new promotions, the cool pictures, and all the things we try to throw out there to the world. They're all these things to just show, I'm making it, I'm, I'm making it, I'm making it, I got it, I'm, I got it going on. Although my story on the inside's eating my lunch. Although the real story's eating my lunch. But I got this thing out here to show you. I got it going on. And the very thing she's using to give herself identity and purpose is the very thing that's keeping her bound. The very thing she's using to show for our identity is the very thing that's keeping her bound to who she's not called to be the very thing she's so boldly standing for is the very thing that's keeping her bound from becoming what she's supposed to be by knowing god having her eyes enlightened to the story yeah i know you've been through some stuff but i can heal you of it and take you forward and she's bound by the very thing she's using for identity look at the next verse verse 38 As she approaches Jesus, 
and actually sees his presence, she begins to break on the inside. When she walks into the presence of Jesus, something on the inside starts breaking. Stuff starts shifting. The real story starts shifting. The real feelings and breaks and hurts and pain start moving. And she breaks on the inside. And verse 38 says, Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. You know, that word isn't, that word weeping is not just like a tear. Like, oh. breaking from the inside like ugly cry you know where you have the (laughs) afterwards like she begins to weep why because the story gets confronted her eyes get enlightened to what i've been living out of to the lies i've been believing the pursuits i've been pursuing I've been living out of something that's not true. I've been trying to be something because of something that happened. I'm trying to prove something because of what happened back there. I'm going to prove that I'm not that or I am that. And all of this becomes up and she begins to break. Her tears fall on his feet. And as she wiped them with her hair, then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. She is literally broken before the Lord. What happened? She met Jesus. She met him in his presence, began to break on the inside, began to break all the stuff up. Her eyes were enlightened to the point where she could see, what am I bound by? What am I living out of that's not true? Things that went on that happened to me. See, to renew you is to have the foundation of knowing Jesus because it's the only thing that will enlighten your eyes. To see what you're really living out of. To see what you're really believing. And this encounter with Jesus broke her on the inside and began to confront every lie and pain that she was living out of. Allow me to say it to you like this, that knowing God leads to finding freedom. It really does. Knowing God leads to finding freedom freedom in your life the only way i'm ever going to get free from the things in my life is when i know god when i pursue him like paul talks about when i consider everything garbage for the sake of knowing him knowing god not just knowing about him knowing him leads to finding this freedom in my life where i am free he says it's for freedom's sake that i set you free it's for freedom's sake that i've set you free to live fully free And only truly knowing Jesus enlightens your eyes to pursue the hurt and the pain of the past. The things you believed about yourself that aren't true. And allowing him to uproot them. I love this thought. That making time for God. I mean making time. Making space to know him. Going after him. Allows him to urgently and gently start uprooting some stuff. How many experienced that before? I know some of you have. I start making time to know him. I start digging in. I start spending some time in his presence. He's the only one that can start uprooting some things that have been there for a long time. And you start going, why have I been living out of that? How did that ever become the leading force of my life? How did I ever start building my life off of the enemy stealing, killing, and destroying from me? Rather than the abundant life of God. Only knowing him leads to that freedom. And in some area of your life, you need freedom today. Every one of us. There's something in your life that if it wasn't in your life, your life would be better. For every one of us. There's something in your life that if it wasn't there, it'd be better. There's something in your marriage that if it wasn't in your marriage, your marriage would be better. There's something in your relationships that if they weren't in your relationships, your relationship would be better. There's something in your finances that if it wasn't in your finances, you would have less stress in your life. There's something in every single one of our lives that if it wasn't there, it would be better. That's freedom. And, and we think, well, maybe God just wants me to live with this or live through this. You would be blown away at how much freedom God actually wants you to live with and experience. You'd be blown away by the things that he is waiting and willing to take and uproot. But we hang on to it and we nurse it and we rehearse it and we pet it and we protect it. And we go, no, this is me. 
when I really begin to know him and I make time to know him, my eyes get enlightened to see this isn't even, this isn't me. This isn't me. It's not who I'm called to be. See, every one of us needs freedom. And I, because of that, I want to show you the step that she took that I think every one of us need to take today. And I hope you're ready. I hope you're ready because she made a bold move in the face of her bondage that I'm going to challenge us to take. And it's actually found in Mark. If you go to Mark 14, what I love about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is there are four different perspectives of the same story. So if you and I watched a car wreck, we'd both have some type of close story, but there'd be differences according to who we are, right? I'd be like, it was pretty crazy, man. The car like was spinning. And you'd be like, oh, it was tragic. Oh, my God. Right? It would be a different perspective. We would see different things. But when you go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're actually different perspectives of the same story, which make them so powerful. And this is what this is. It's a different perspective of the same story we just read. And what Mark saw in this story is phenomenal. It's your step today that I'm challenging you to do to get out of, to get out of bondage. She faced her bondage. Check this out. Same story, different perspective. Mark says, meanwhile, Jesus was in, in Bethany at the house or home of Simon, a man who previously had leprosy. Isn't that funny? We didn't know that. Jesus probably healed him. That's why I invited him over for dinner. While he was eating, a woman came in with a beautiful, here we see it again, beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. Mark likes to add a few more categories in there, details. Check this out. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. This is a totally different perspective of what we see in the first part. You know what she did? She walked in and encountered the presence of Jesus. And the very thing that meant the most to her in her life the very thing that she was hanging on to for identity, the thing she was living out of, the one thing that she had accomplished in life, she broke it for the sake of Jesus. She takes this very expensive jar, the most precious thing in her life, and demolishes it for the sake of Jesus. For the sake of knowing him more, for the sake of drawing near to him, she demolishes the bondage, breaks it completely, to find out who he really is and begins to weep at his presence, breaking the bondage completely to know this Jesus. She breaks the lie. She breaks the false identity. She breaks the false meaning. All the twisted things that she had once believed, she breaks it because of the presence of Jesus. And I'm asking you today, I'm asking you to be bold enough today to do what she did and some of you in this room today, you need to break your bondage. You need to get bold enough to break your bondage, to destroy that thing that has a hold of you, to let go of the thing that has a hold of you. Break your bondage. Quit giving yourself an excuse to go back. That's why she broke it. You know why she broke this? Because she wasn't going to give herself any excuse, any reason to run back to where she once was. She wasn't going to give herself any pathway or any road to go back to the lies that she was believing, to run back to the safe place that she had lived in for so long. She said, no, I'm destroying this thing. There is no way this thing's going to have any hold in my life any longer because I have just seen him. I have just met him. I have met the one who actually identifies who I really am. And she breaks the bondage because I'm not going back. I am not going back to that. No way. And she literally destroys the pathway back to the thing that kept her in bondage. That's bold. That's facing your bondage in a bold way. She breaks it, completely destroys it. The interesting thing about this alabaster jar to me is that it could only be opened one time. The way the thing was set up is that you, if you opened it, you pretty much used it. It's like she was just waiting. She didn't know why, but she was waiting. What's the most meaningful thing? See, we've got to quit giving ourselves a way back to the bondage. We've got to keep quit giving ourselves an excuse to go back to the bondage. No, break the bondage. Once you know him, 
your eyes can be enlightened to know the truth, and you are set up to break the bondage that holds you. What are you holding on to today that's actually holding you back? What, do you, what lie are you hanging on to? What experience? Maybe it's not a lie. Maybe it's as real as anything can be. What are you holding on to or living out of today that's actually holding you back from who God's called you to be? You got to break it. You got to break it. And I love this clarifying statement, verses 8 and 9, what Jesus says about her. Jesus makes this statement in verse 8 and 9. He says this because the Pharisees just get all mad. This, oh my goodness, this could have been sold and given to the poor. This was worth a year's wages, they said. They were all mad that she broke it. And Jesus pretty much said, shut up. Here's what he says to him: She has done what she could and has anointed my body for burial for a time to come. Verse 9, I tell you the truth. Wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. You want to know why he said that? Because the good news being preached is the message of salvation. That you can come to God. You can be restored to him again. He wants to be friends with you. He's not mad at you. Come back to God. That's the good news. But the, the action of the good news is that I break everything to get in. The action of the good news is what she did. This story will be preached wherever the good news is preached because in the good news of coming back to God is the fact that I break everything that has bound me to get hit the life that he has for me. I'm breaking everything that connects me to Satan stealing, killing, and destroying from me to get the life that God has prepared for me. That's the good news of the gospel, that I would break all of the bondages. Nothing would hold me back to getting him. And he's saying the action that she just lived out is the good news. And it's the action of salvation, breaking the bondage, the good news of salvation. Give your life. And here's the thing. I'm just going to be bold this morning because I love you. Some of you haven't done all. He says, she did all she could. The Pharisees in their pompous attitude are all, oh my goodness. He pretty much says, shut your mouth. This woman just did everything she could to know me. And some of you in here haven't done everything you could. For most Americans, we do as little as we can. It's just how we live. It's just... We want something for as little as possible. And we struggle in our faith and we struggle experiencing the fullness of God because if we don't break it and go all in, then we struggle with why we're not seeing the compensation of God's presence and his character and his goodness and his purpose for our life. And he's saying she did everything she could. She gave everything she could to know me. To the point where she is broken in my presence, weeping at my feet. Her tears are washing my feet. She's gone all in. You know what's phenomenal about this? Is she didn't know he was going to die for her. And she gave all. She had no idea that he would give his life for her pain and her sin. And she gave all. And we do. We read this story afterwards. And we know the one she's broken over actually gave all as well. We know the story. And we still don't give all. We know the story, and we don't break our bondage on behalf of him. This woman broke everything that she once was and had, had been done to her so that she could know him, not knowing that he would give everything on her behalf. And we know it. We know that he gave his life for us. Let me ask you something. The thing you're holding on to this morning. 
how much did it give up for you? That lie, that experience, that pain, that struggle, that frustration, that bitterness, that thing that we hold on to, that I, I, no one's taken this from me. What did that give for you? What did that give up for you? Because in light of the one that gave all for you, it's worth breaking so that it will let go of you so that you can have your eyes enlightened to see your purpose on the planet. This is freedom. This is freedom. When I know God, I find freedom and I discover why I'm on the earth. And so your freedom this morning, church, it starts by breaking the bondage. Will you do it? Will you be bold enough to break it for the sake of who he is and what he's done for you? This is my challenge today. There's something in your life that if it wasn't in your life, your life would be better. And you're fighting to hang on to it because you feel like it gives you clout for the way you live and the things you do and the people you surround yourself with. All the while, it's holding you back from the one that gave everything for you. And this is my challenge today. Break your bondage. Finally, let's start the new year. Stand up in front of that thing and face it in a bold way with the realization that I've gone long enough. I've lived long enough through this thing. I've dealt with this thing long enough. I'm going to break it. It's bold. I'm going to break it. But there's a filling on the other side of that breaking. And it's the presence of God. That's my challenge for you today.